As we began our, our parenting class a couple of uh, Fridays uh, ago, and uh, using again the uh, Reb Bradley uh, DVD and the book by, by Reb, uh, one of the things he pointed out the very first night is if uh, parents, if you really don't get this, uh, the rest of the class may not m make a lot of sense to you. And that is the purpose in raising your children. What should be the purpose in raising and training your children? And as he said, and uh, I said uh, an amen, at least in my heart to it, is that the purpose in raising your children should be to make them dangerous for the kingdom of God. Uh, it's not just enough to get them to say yes, yes sir, no sir, uh, and, uh, and, and come to dinner on time, uh, but it's really to train them up so that they'll, they'll be proactive in, uh, in spreading the gospel and living their lives for, uh, for Jesus Christ. Uh, that kind of brought, brought to mind a, a story I had shared with you a couple of uh, years ago, I think, by Erwin uh, McManus, and it was a, a, a story in a, in a magazine that I saw where he was talking about his young son, elementary school age, that had gone to, to camp uh, for a week or so and had returned home. And he mentions in the article how, you know, he didn't want to send his son, you know, to uh, just a regular camp because he didn't want the ghost stories at night and have his son be scared to death when he came home at the end of the week. Apparently he had experienced that. So he sends them to the church camp, the Christian camp. What were the stories they told around the campfire? All about Satan and demons every night. So by the time his kid gets home, he goes to tuck him in and pray with him. And as uh, the article goes, quote, he says, uh, uh, Daddy, would you pray with me that I would be safe? <laughs> and, uh, and he says this, uh, uh, I, I could feel it. I could feel warm blanket Christianity beginning to wrap around him. A life of safety, safety, safety. Because, you know, he, he can't lie to the kid and say they don't exist. They exist. Uh, so he says, uh, Aaron, I will not pray for you to be safe. I will pray that God makes you dangerous. So dangerous that demons will flee when you enter the room. All right, Daddy, but pray that I would be really, really dangerous. <laughs> and then he goes on to say, if you come to that place in your life where you stop asking God to make your life safe and make you a dangerous follower of Jesus Christ, it's a good place to come to. And what I want to suggest is that, in a sense, that's what we have in this passage this morning. There's going to be a litmus test, an example by Jesus, by which we can really see are we at that place where we're willing to say, Lord, will you make me dangerous for uh, the kingdom of God? Well, it all begins in verse 31 as Jesus announces another startling announcement to the disciples, and that is uh, their own failure, verse 31. Then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Uh, again, lots of announcements going on here that he's going to be handed over to the chief priest and so forth, the Sanhedrin, that he's going to be killed, but he'll rise again three days later, startling announcements. Uh, and then the one we looked at last week, they already said, there's a betrayer among you. And in fact, as they eat the Passover Seder, he's somebody in that room with them, and that's uh, certainly startling. And, and these announcements uh, continue. First, we notice that the announcement of the failure will happen in fulfillment of prophecy, and the prophecy here is Zechariah 13, 7. I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be, be scattered. And of course, Peter, verse 35, uh, objects to that, but Jesus says, no, the word of God says, and it's going to happen. And uh, secondly, he says, uh, he announces his resurrection despite the failure of the disciples. In other words, Jesus knows they're all going to fail. But he says, I'm going to die on the cross for you anyway, and I'm going to rise again. Your, your performance and your behavior is not going to stop what I'm going to do for you. 
uh, I'm going to be faithful even if you're faithless. And uh, certainly we can appreciate that. And he gives these specific instructions. He says, and I will go ahead of you into, into Galilee. We're, this is going to be hard for the next couple of days, what's going to happen. But we're just getting started here in terms of uh, the kingdom of God and the ministry that I've got for you guys. Uh, the, uh, the angel talking to the woman uh, a couple chapters over, 28 verse 6 says, Then go quickly and tell his disciples... He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So again, these announcements come. And of course, we get to the third aspects of this, uh, the announcement that Peter will fail him uh, three times. Of course, Peter jumps in <laughs> as we would expect. Oh, I'll never fail you. Though I'll fail you, I'll, I'll, I'll never fail you. And reminds us of his confession earlier in Matthew 16. Again, when he has divine revelation, Jesus says, um, who do men say that I am? And of course, it gets to Peter. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Flesh and blood have not revealed to this to you, but my father in heaven. Of course, Peter's like, all right, I got one, you know. And of course, it's just five verses later that Jesus says to him in verse 21 of Matthew 16. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside. Don't you think that was kind of Peter to take him aside before he rebuked him? Uh, Peter probably thought he was being really gracious here. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Uh, verse 23, Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And uh, we're talking to somebody between the services, and we all agreed that we sure appreciate Peter. <laughs> because I think Jesus picked him because he knew he'd say all this stuff, and it would give him the avenue through which to really teach us some things about our, uh, our, ourselves. Uh, Peter, you don't want me to go to the cross? Neither does Satan. You know, there's, there's a lot of forces in this world, Peter, that don't want me to die for the sins of the world. What you're thinking of is the way the world thinks, are there a few people out there that think it was unnecessary for Jesus to die for the sins of the world? There's a, there's a lot of people that think that and think that you can have a relationship with God without the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And Jesus says that thought originates with Satan. Uh, when you think that, you're thinking of a philosophy of this world. With Peter, we see two major pitfalls here that I, that I want to point out that I think are very helpful to us. Again, uh, is it possible for us to betray, to fall away? We might use the term backslide. Well, here's, here's two things that led to Peter's backsliding or betrayal. Uh, one is he failed to understand his weakness and the power of the enemy. He failed to understand how weak he really was. Oh, I'll never fail you. You know, and he's, he's right there. It'll, it'll never happen uh, to me. I'll die with you if necessary. He really failed to understand his own weakness and his own strength. Uh, and certainly he underestimated the, the, uh, the enemy. Now it was the Apostle Paul that uh, uh, kind of gives us the classic verse in terms of uh, the idea of it's, more, uh, it's better to be weak than it is to be strong. It's better to ha have an understanding that I need to be in complete dependence upon God. Uh, and when I am, that's when I'm actually the, uh, the strongest. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, uh, but he said to me, and again, this is Paul talking about after God did not heal him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Our tendency is towards sin and self-centeredness. Our tendency uh, is, not, is not the other way uh, to the things of the Lord. Uh, Peter underestimates uh, the power of the enemy. He overestimates his own ability and his strength. And if we do either one, we're going to find ourselves, I think, betraying the Lord, falling in a time of temptation. Uh, again, listen to what uh, uh, Luke's gospel tells us about this situation in Luke 22, 31. Um, I would find this first statement very startling if I were Peter. Uh, I think, <laughs> Simon, Simon, Satan is asked to sift you as wheat, 
but I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Now, can you imagine Jesus saying to you, by the way, Satan has pinpointed you. Again, Satan is not uh, omnipresent. He's not, he's just one, 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 one personality, one entity. He can't be everywhere at once. So if he's pinpointing something, I mean, we kind of say that. Oh man, I had a rough day. Satan was all over me today. I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. Uh, maybe one of his minions was after you or whatever. You might have had a first private or something, but uh, I think he's kind of got bigger fish to catch. He was probably in the Kremlin or uh, another uh, capital of the world influencing. He's probably visiting our friend Ak Ahmed Bunajad over there in Iran, and uh, he's uh, with Kim Jong, who's very ill in North Korea. He's probably uh, with one of those guys. Uh, he's only one place at a time. So what a frightening state statement to say, Satan is actually specifically uh, after you. But notice uh, uh, his reply. Uh, uh, but he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you'll deny me three times that you, that you know me. Uh, Peter really overestimates his ability to fight temptation. Uh, and he really underestimates uh, the power uh, of the enemy. That's why Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, 11, to put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. The word schemes is an interesting one because it means a specific plot or a specific trap or a specific plan. Sometimes we say, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Guess what? Satan hates you and he's got a plan for your life as well, according to uh, Paul. And he is patient. He is patient. He doesn't attack David when he's a young teenage guy, rejected by his father, by his brothers, uh, the one that's not counted even as a son and is put out with the shepherd. That wasn't the best job to have, by the way. Uh, he's out there and he's pretty much alone. But he cries out to the Lord, sings worship songs to the Lord. The Lord's all he's got. Satan doesn't attack him then. Doesn't attack him as a young teenage guy when he sees uh, uh, Goliath insulting the God of heaven. Hey, God has helped me against the bear and the lion. This guy will be no different. I'll just go out and the Lord will, will do the fighting. I'll take him out. Satan doesn't attack him then. Uh, he writes in the Psalms that the Lord has trained my hands for warfare, for battle. He's actually trained me. David says the reason that I can fight so well with a sword and take on 10 guys at a time is because of what God's done. Satan doesn't attack him then as he leads the armies of Israel against the Philistines. Now Satan does he waits decades because he had a scheme and he waited until David was at a place of, in a sense, where he thought he was strong in himself and no longer as dependent upon the Lord as he was as a young kid. And at that point, he springs the trap. Paul says, put on the full armor of God because it's exactly the same way for each one of us. We need to be very careful that we don't think we're stronger than we are. Pride goes before destruction. That's not good, by the way, in a haughty spirit before a fall. We need to be very, uh, very careful. The second thing, again, he failed to understand his weakness, the power of the enemy. But notice also, Peter, <laughs> he, he felt he was stronger than the other believers, you know, spiritually and, and so forth. Even if all fall away, I never will. You see, I'm different. I'm unique. I'm not like the other guys. And there, there's a real danger in that. Let me tell you how it plays out. Oh, well, you know, it's different in my situation. My situation is unique. You know, you know yeah, I, I talked to so-and-so uh, down at the office. She's a sweet gal, and she's really, uh, you know, hey, nothing's going on because, you know, she understands. She's a very good listener. And every, you see, my wife, she just doesn't really understand or have enough time for me. I have a lot of stress. I got a lot going on. You know, I kind of need somebody to vent with. And yeah, oh, I can see what you're saying. You know, some people, yeah, you'd have to worry about that. I would never go there. You know, I'm not that way. I just kind of need somebody to vent with, you know, and lunch a couple times a week. This is really no big deal. My situation is different. I'm really unique in this. Somebody else might fall, not me. You're looking for trouble. By the way, you're stupid. But, uh, <laughs> but, but by the way, that's how it plays out. I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this is one of the greatest ploys of Satan to make you think that you and your situation 
and your circumstances are unique, and they're not unique. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 10 13, no temptation has, exceased, uh, has seized you except what is common to man. Is there any temptation that makes you unique? No, Paul says. What God has you is common. It's common. It's the same. What's sin for one person? Guess what? It's sin for another person. You're not unique. You don't have some kind of built-in uh, excuse. But he says, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Again, Peter falls because he overestimates his own strength and he underestimates uh, the enemy, Satan. And then he feels that he is stronger than other believers. So Jesus announced ahead of time the failure of the disciples. They couldn't accept it, but it was going to happen. Secondly, we see in verse 36 to 46, Jesus would agree in prayer to the Father's will. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. It's an interesting uh, uh, picture, and uh, I don't want to over-spiritualize it, but uh, as they walk through the streets, remember we left off last week with them leaving that upper room and, uh, and singing the Halal Psalms as they, as they went, and, and so many of those certainly would have been echoing in their minds all the way from when uh, they were sung as Jesus entered the city uh, the week before on Sunday. But here they are, moonlight, it's Passover, it's a full moon as they make their way uh, down the Kidron Valley and they begin to cross the stream at the bottom. Uh, it would have been an interesting sight for them, one they were probably used to, but uh, interesting nonetheless. You see uh, up there on the temple there would have been uh, a channel that would have, uh, for drainage from the temple that would have led down to this stream where those 250,000 lambs had just been slaughtered the day before for each of the families to be able to have the Passover Seder or, or dinner together. And that stream would have been blood red that night in the moon, blood red with the, the blood of the lambs slain for the sins of the people. And here Jesus, the Lamb of God, he's crossing over, going to pray, to wait to be arrested. He knows exactly what's, what's going on. As he goes up the mountain, even today, uh, it, there in the Mount of Olives, there's olive trees all over it. It is still an, uh, an area it's in, uh, where, the, where the trees grow. Uh, many of them, they say, dating back to the time of, uh, of Jesus. Uh, and there would have been gardens in that area. And of course, the Gethsemane means olive press. And, and there would have been one of those on the hillside uh, as well. In terms of jo Jesus going there, he goes there to be arrested. Luke 21, 37 says that each day Jesus was teaching at the temple, and each evening he went to spend the night on the hill called the Mount of Olives. And we talked about that. Even if they were at, at uh, Lazarus' home in Bethany, they would have come up over the hill and then stopped in the Garden of Gethsemane, overlooking the city. He would have briefed his guys. This is what was going on today. This is what we're doing. Into the city, back out of the city, pause and again, in a sense, a debrief, and they either spent the night there or back over uh, to uh, Lazarus and Martha and Mary's home uh, once again. 
but here they are, and Jesus is now praying as he waits to be arrested. And, uh, and again, we're familiar with the prayer, but I, I think it teaches us uh, three important lessons. And one of the things, if you think about uh, how important this is, keep in mind the fact that as Jesus goes alone to pray, Nobody's recording it. There's not a little cassette player going and goes, you'll want this later. It's going to make uh, good writing when you write the gospel stories. So how do these guys know what Jesus prayed, what he said, and what he felt? Jesus had to tell them. He had to tell them later. So e evidently, this was so important that as post-resurrection, Jesus has to recount some details that were private before because he wants us to know them. Uh, so Pretty, pretty important stuff here. And uh, the, the first thing uh, that I think is uh, an important lesson is kind of a theological one. It teaches us that there's only one way to obtain salvation. We see that in, in the prayer Jesus prays three times. My Father, if it's possible, if, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. If what is possible... Is it possible for mankind to be saved from their sins in any other way? But no, it's not possible. You know, it's the prevailing thought uh, of the day that, uh, that uh, it's great that you're a Christian. It's great that you found peace with God. You have your way, I have my way. <laughs> Kathy and I both kind of came out of the New Age movement. It was funny as we would go around and try to share our testimonies and try to explain that our sins have been forgiven and we have a new life in Christ and all these things. And uh, we were excited about the Word of God and stuff to our, our friends. And they would all say the same thing. They would say, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. That's great. You found peace with God. You have a way. You have your way. I have my way. Uh, but the main thing is that we know God. That's so wonderful. <laughs> but it's like, no, 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 that's not quite what I meant, you know. But, but, but that's the prevailing thought. I saw a little uh, video clip the other day that was, that's on YouTube of uh, Oprah Winfrey. I don't know if you ever heard of her before. She got a little TV show and has some books around once in a while. And she's uh, just a little bit influential. And uh, anyway, on the show, uh, there was a little question and answer thing. And a gal stood up, obviously a Christian, in explaining that uh, Jesus died for her sins. Her sins are forgiven. She knows she's going to go to heaven. So she's kind of given the gospel. Well, this is great, you know, uh, and, uh, and everything. And then o Ophrah jumps to her feet very quickly, very agitated. You can't, you're, you're not saying, she says, you're not saying, I'm paraphrasing, I can't do a direct quote. She says, you're not saying that Jesus is the only way someone can know God. I mean, that is not even reasonable. What about the millions of people around the world and through history that have never heard the name of Jesus, never heard their, what, what are you saying about them? I mean, that's unreasonable. You, I mean, it's a way, it's a way, but you can't tell me it's the only way. And then so another Christian gal jumps up in the crowd and she is even more articulate and says, yes, it is. Jesus said this, said this. And she kind of gives a little quick defense for the faith and everything. But uh, it's interesting. You know, people get agitated over this idea. But when they're saying that, they are saying that Jesus suffered and was brutalized and died on a Roman cross for nothing. If there was another way, to know God and have your sins forgiven. If there was another way, being a good person, meditating so many times a day, reading a certain book, whatever it might be, having good thoughts, what, if there was another way, why in the world would Jesus leave heaven and, and uh, live a perfect sinless life and be brutalized on a cross? It's an affront to, to who Jesus is, his character and what he did for, for you and I. It's a prevailing thought, but Jesus answers the question right here. Is it possible? It's not possible. A very important theological lesson. Let me just read a little bit from Max Licato, and I don't agree fully with some of the statements he thinks, but I think from a devotional point, it's, uh, uh, it helps bring uh, some of this home. He says, uh, did he know the answer before he asked the question? Did his human heart hope his heavenly father had found another way? We don't know. But we do know he asked to get out. We do know he begged for an exit. We do know there was a time when if he could have, he would have turned his back on the whole mess and gone away, but he couldn't. He couldn't because he saw you right there in the middle of a world which isn't fair. He saw you cast into a river of life you didn't request. 
He saw you betrayed by those you love. He saw you with a body which gets sick and a heart which grows weak. He saw you in your own garden of gnarled trees and sleeping friends. He saw you staring into the pit of your own failures in the mouth of your own grave. He saw you in your garden of Gethsemane and he didn't want you to face it alone. He wanted you to know that he had been there too. And perhaps most of all, he knows what it's like to beg, beg God to change his mind and to hear God say so gently but firmly, no. That happens sometimes, doesn't it? And, uh, and the Lord knows he's experienced it firsthand. The second thing that we learned here, again, that Jesus is the only way to salvation. The second one, very important, he teaches us that there is a need for submission. Uh, again, how do we pray in times of real stress and anxiety? We, I mean, we get prayer requests. We hear so-and-so lost their job. Okay, we're going to pray for a, a, a job, and, and that's good. We intercede uh, for our, our daily needs, our daily bread, the cares and concerns of her. What, what happens when it gets ratcheted up a little bit? A couple years ago, we got a, a phone call. One of my nephews had a, had a tumor, a brain tumor, and uh, he's, uh, he's being taken to, uh, from a community hospital to a, a bigger hospital in San Francisco. Uh, they're going to operate. They're going to do a biopsy. And, of course, they're very concerned about cancer. He's, he's about 29 years old. And, uh, and they were calling, asking us to pray, which we, which we did. Now, my prayer went something like this. I'm praying, Lord, I pray that you'd heal him. I pray that it's not cancer. I pray that you'd give the doctors great skill. I, I pray that this would all go well. I pray that you'd give the rest of the family peace and so forth. My, my tendency was not to pray this prayer, though, which I think is the prayer of Jesus here. Lord, if it's your will and if it's cancer, I pray you'd be glorified at it. If you take his life in two months or three months, may he speak to as many people he can about your comfort and your love and the hope of heaven. Lord, use his life to the fullest, even if it's a short life. Your will be done, Lord, not my will be done. That's a little different prayer. You understand when Jesus is praying this, He's sweating like great drops of blood. This is not an easy deal. He understands exactly what he's about ready to go through. And if you've ever seen the film, The Passion of Christ, you get a glimpse into what it was to be scourged by, by the Romans. Most people didn't survive. They mostly bled to death. The ones that didn't bleed to death went insane. This is before he got to the cross. Jesus knows exactly what, what awaits him. Uh, again, it's Dr. Luke that open, uh, offers the commentary in Luke 22, 44. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like the drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, Dr. Luke doesn't say it was blood falling to the ground. He says it was like, but obviously he's trying to let us know the intensity of what it was like. How did he know that? Jesus told him, and he wanted us to know. But again, Jesus prayed, and as he was praying, he understood who it was that he was praying to. Who was handing him the cup? It wasn't Caiaphas, it wasn't Herod, and it wasn't Pilate. It was his father. Verse 39, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Mark's gospel includes the phrase in verse 36 of chapter 14, Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus understood who was handing him the cup. If you're going to get to this point in a time of high anxiety and great concern, whatever it is, medically, relationship-wise, work-wise, economically, whatever it is, whatever it comes around, if you're going to get to this point around this, this thing to be able to say, not my will, but your will be done, you've got to be able to say, and Father, I know you've allowed this to happen. I know you have it for a reason. I don't get it. I don't understand. I would have done it differently. Would you like a little advice? And then when you, we have a tendency to figure it out for God so he knows how to fix it. And then eventually we want to get around to that and say, but not my will, thy will be done. The Bible offers us a very interesting commentary on it and it's found in, in, in Hebrews 7. Uh, if you want to, if you, and you might want to turn there. If you're a Bible underliner uh, and you key things in, uh, this is one you might want to underline. I, I've got it for you if you don't want to turn there, but Hebrews chapter 5, uh, verse 7. There it says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions 
with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect. That, per that word perfect means he completes the mission. He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. A couple of rhetorical questions. And the first one is, are we saved from the suffering of Jesus Christ? And the answer to that is no. We are saved by the death and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And these are two separate things. Certainly there's some suffering that goes on on the cross, but there was a lot of suffering, uh, maybe even most of it, that happens before he gets to the cross. So why did Jesus need to suffer? And the writer of Hebrews says, he was heard because of his reverent submission uh, in exactly the time we're talking about. So in other words, Jesus goes through all of this so that you and I would see what it looks like when a person lives in reverent submission to God. And certainly that's, that's where we're trying to get at as believers. Listen to what Peter says about this in 1 Peter 2.21. And he was there sleeping at the time, but he was there. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Uh, again, uh, his final prayer, his final pain, his final passion here was for you and I, but it was to teach us something, to show us an example. Again, let me just say the obvious again. And uh, in my mind, I keep envisioning the, the Mel Gibson movie and, and all that Jesus went through in terms of that scourging. You mean the only reason he went through all of that was to teach us a lesson? Absolutely. He went through all of that just to teach us and show us what submission uh, looks like. Uh, and so it's an, incredible, it's an incredible lesson that we ought to get. What does it take to be dangerous for the kingdom of God? It takes a life that says, no matter what's going on, and when I pray, at the end, I say, but Lord, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. The third thing this teaches us is that uh, there's a danger in sleeping and not watching and praying. We see that in verse 41. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And again, why are we to be watching? Well, Peter was there. He tells us in uh, his epistle, his first epistle, chapter 5, verse 8, he says, rather than be sleepy, he said, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of, of suffering. The devil has a scheme. He has a plan. He's very patient. He's like a roaring lion. And you better not be sleeping. <laughs> Instead, you better be self-controlled and you better be alert. Uh, and, and again, that's what we see they weren't at the, at the time. We must pray. We must rely upon God's strength. But uh, uh, again, we need to do that because Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh or the body is weak. And that word weak is the same word that's used for Lazarus right before he dies. <laughs> so that means... The spirit is willing, and that's all you got. <laughs> because your, your own motivation, your own, I can do it, uh, your own whatever you can conjure up in terms of how you think you can serve the Lord on our own or what we can do in and of ourselves and our own strength, it's worth nothing. What did Jesus say in uh, Matthew, or excuse me, in John 15, 5? I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do Nada, I think that, or nothing. You can't do anything. Uh, the flesh is willing. Uh, the body won't help you in this. G. Campbell Morgan, the great British preacher, said, maintain the life of fellowship with God. However dark the day, however rough the way, for the soul at worship is the soul who is ever guarded against temptation. That's what we're talking about. How do we prevent backsliding? How do we prevent betrayal, falling away from, uh, from the Lord? Well, well it's uh, watching and praying. Uh, we need to be careful. Joseph, Joseph Schreiden was a guy that grew up in Ireland and had a 
very prestigious home. He was wealthy, uh, had a tremendous education and a devoted family and all went well for him and his life and his Christian experience until the night before his marriage when his fiance drowned and his uh, life came apart at that point. He decided some months later to uh, leave Ireland and move to Port, uh, po excuse me, Port Hope, Canada, determined to devote all of his time that he could to, to serving others in, in the name of Christ. Uh, he was there for so long, he became known as the Good Samaritan of, of Port Hope. When his mother back in Ireland became ill, he wrote her a letter and then scribbled down a, a, a poem to try to minister to her own heart. The poem reads like this. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Jesus announces that they're going to fail, but he's going to be faithful. He agrees in prayer to the Father's will and gives us an incredible example of what a submitted life looks like. Thirdly, we see the arrest as predicted in Scripture, verse 47 to 56. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him with a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priest and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with him. The one I kiss is the man arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. Uh, with that, one of Jesus' companions reached for a sword, drew it out, struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scripture be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion? That you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me. Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you, you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled, that all the disciples deserted him and fled. A couple things about the arrest, and one is the, uh, the fact that Judas arrives here with a large crowd to arrest Jesus, carrying torches, lanterns, weapons. And uh, we, find, we know from uh, John 18, 3, that it was a detachment of Roman troops. Uh, that means there were, uh, there were 600 of them, 600 Roman, Roman soldiers. Plus, we know that the temple guard was with them, plus representatives of the Sanhedrin uh, uh, it, that we, we have identified as uh, the chief priest servant is there. And by the way, we know his name is Malchus, and by chief servant, that means he's like his right-hand guy. Uh, so he's probably the highest official that's out there, the guy that we know that Peter cuts his ear off. And, uh, and by the way, <laughs> we also know that uh, Jesus then took the ear, put it back on, and, and healed him. And the reason he did that is so there wouldn't be four crosses the next day instead of three. Uh, God still had some plans for Peter and didn't want to uh, interrupt him at that point. Uh, John and the other writers make this uh, contrast, uh, I think, uh, uh, important to us. There's a thousand plus armed soldiers out there to arrest one itinerant rabbi who's waiting on them. And when they show up, he goes out to greet them and says, who are you looking for? You know, and uh, uh, he's, uh, the contrast is, is obvious. The second part of this is he allows the arrest to take place. And he says so and says it's fulfillment of scripture. Uh, there's a, a portion in John's gospel that uh, uh, I just enjoy reading. Uh, it's uh, John 18, 4. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, said Jesus. And Judas the traitor was standing there with him. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now what he says to him, the he is not there in, in a Greek text. He just says, I am, which is he uses the, the name of God. The name God reveals to Moses at the burning bush when Moses says, who should I say is sending me? Say, I am that I am, the eternal one. And when Jesus says that, he knocks, he knocks a thousand guys on the ground. I don't know if you get that. But this is like, I mean, we kind of 
laugh about the slain in the spirit thing and everything. This is it right here. When Jesus says these words, a thousand guys fall on the ground. They get back up and they ask him the same thing again. I just kind of wondered if guys went like this when he was getting ready to answer the, the second time. And, and I think the, the reason that Jesus does that, John includes it uh, in, uh, in Jesus, these words that it's in fulfillment of prophecy is to make sure that we understand who's, uh, who's in control. Previously in John 10, 18, Jesus said of his life, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up uh, again. Uh, Luke, again, is the one that tells us it's Peter that cuts off the, uh, the, the ear of the high priest. And, and uh, uh, church history says that Malchus comes to faith in Christ after his resurrection. I, we don't know that he did. Certainly makes for a good story. And I mean... <laughs> get your hair cut off and the guy puts it back on and it's fine. I think that would give you food for thought uh, for over the next couple of days as he watched Jesus die on the cross and then, uh, and then rise again. Uh, again, Jesus informs them that he could prevent this from happening, but it must happen and it must happen in this very specific way. He says, I could call on 12 legions of angels. That's 72,000. Uh, we know that in this one story in the Old Testament, one angel killed 185,000 uh, Assyrian troops in one night. 72,000 could do a little bit of damage. Uh, and so Jesus makes it very clear is that don't think that I'm not in control. I am in totally in control with what's, what's going on here. And thirdly, then, uh, the arrest is a fulfillment of, of prophecy. Listen to what Peter says when he gets it later. Acts chapter 2, preaching now that he's been filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, 2.22, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. On that particular day, the death of Jesus, over 30 prophecies uh, were fulfilled. The one about the guys getting knocked on the ground, Psalm 27, says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. And it, uh, it goes on, on and on. I think that uh, uh, for us, uh, again, this idea of watching the life of Jesus, watching the way he is arrested, watching the prayer in the garden, it's all there and recorded for us that we might be dangerous for God. And I think that uh, sometimes we kind of forget life is busy. <laughs> we got to work for a living and keep our bills paid and do the laundry and all that fun stuff. And we forget really what we're living for and what Christ has done for us. I think that's a great, uh, a, a great thing to keep in mind in, in the purpose of raising your children to make them dangerous for God. But I think we probably want that as, as adults as, as well. I wanted to read you one other uh, story, speaking of which, I was um, watching a very fascinating Veggie Tales yesterday afternoon with Vanessa, and in uh, and the beginning, it's the one of Gideon, I think, and in the beginning, they actually do a little story of George Mueller, and uh, if you haven't had a chance, uh, I've given some of you guys uh, little books about him and stuff, but uh, tremendous man of faith, uh, lived in the uh, late uh, 1800s, and uh, kind of a breakthrough in a philosophy of ministry that said... I'm never going to tell other men whatever needs I have. I will only tell God, and he'll provide. That's where Pastor Chuck, we get the idea of where God guides, God provides. As Chuck says, if it's good enough for George, it's good enough for, for me. But Mueller was a guy that, uh, as a pastor, and then later starting many orphanages in London, would never say what the needs were or anything. They would just pray and get the kids to pray. If there was no food the next day for a meal, they would just pray and they would trust God. And then he found a kindred spirit in a guy named Hudson Taylor, who did the same thing and adopted that same philosophy of ministry. But uh, on February 6th in 1870, Mueller's wife Mary died of rheumatic fever. After uh, a few weeks, he was able to preach his uh, first sermon 
He called it his funeral sermon, and it was based on Psalm 119, verse 68, that says, you are good and do good. And this was his three-point sermon that day uh, on behalf of his wife of um, uh, 39 years. Uh, and this is what he says in his sermon. Point one, the Lord was good and did good in giving her to me. Point two, the Lord was good and did good in so long leaving her to me. Point three, the Lord was good and did good in taking her from me. And, uh, and then the, he says this, quote, Yes, my father, the times of my darling wife are in thy hands. Thou wilt do the very best thing for her and for me, whether life or death, he's praying for her. If it may be, raise her up again, my precious wife. Thou art able to do it, though she is so ill. But howsoever thou dealest with me, only help me to continue to be perfectly satisfied with thy holy will. Lord, I pray that you'd raise her up. She's very sick. She's been my wife for almost 40 years. But whatever you decide to do, help me to be perfectly satisfied with whatever your will is for me. That's a dangerous guy for the kingdom of God. And George Mueller was. And if you think about the suffering that Jesus went through, go back and read through the scriptures again that I gave you, that, that Jesus went through that suffering just to teach us, to set an example, Peter says, to show us what reverent submission is. It's, it's just, it's a radical concept uh, when, when you think about it. And, uh, and I think for us, th there's times when it's very easy to say and pray something and, Lord, not my will, your will be done. There's a lot of times it's really hard. It's really hard. And, and uh, I think it's, we ought to be praying, save them, heal them, help them, you know, uh, all those things that first come to mind that seem, seem like, you know. But there there's, should be a time where we, we kind of come around the other side of it, though, and quiet our heart and be able to say, but Lord, I submit my life to you. And whatever your will is, Lord, help me like George Mueller to be deeply satisfied with your will and your outcome. That's, that's a surrendered life. Uh, that's, that's a life and that's a person that becomes very dangerous for the for the kingdom of God. Wash over me, wash over me. Wash over me, wash over me.
take this heart Cause only you can take this heart Only you can take this mind Only you can take this life And make it look like Jesus Cause only you can take this heart Only you can take this mind Only you can take this life And make it look like Jesus Cause only you of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord. Oh my Take it out. Oh my. 
That's for my God, His way is perfect. That's for my God, His word is true. That's for my God, He is my refuge and my shield. So not be moved. I shall not be moved. I have set the Lord before me. He is at my right hand. I will bless the Lord so holy. He is my inheritance. As for my God, He will preserve me. As for my God, He makes me strong. As for my God. the Lord and give him praise. Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for your presence here today.